Good morning. My name is Martin Lanchester. Hopefully you can see that we're joined by uh, James Bentley, uh, who's on screen as well and nodding sagely. Um, welcome to our uh, Guildhall Chambers bre Breakfast Bites this morning, and we're doing a costs law update uh, for you. Uh, it's fantastic to see so many people have joined online at, at such an early hour, and there's some familiar names there and some I don't know, so welcome to you all. It's great to have you with us. Um, now, these breakfast bites have usually been, uh, well, before the pandemic, in person, uh, usually in Bristol, and it's a great way of actually getting to meet people uh, face to face, share some coffee and a bite to eat. And we were hoping to run that this morning. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the pandemic was against us uh, still, uh, and on balance, it was better to be done as a webinar this morning. But hopefully, this may be the last that we do entirely remotely. Uh, and next time, something uh, suitably lavish could be laid on in terms of food and drinks. Uh, and actually, we can spend some time uh, getting to meet each other. Um, what I'm going to do is just deal with uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, I think everyone is, <laughs> everyone's very uh, familiar with this now, but can I ask you to make sure your, your microphone is mute, muted and your camera is switched off? Um, <laughs> do not take control of the slide. That would be uh, uh, difficult for us. So, so please don't, don't play with that. Uh, but do please engage with any comments or questions that you want to ask by using the chat function. Um, and depending on the time we've got, what we intend to do is uh, to deal with those at the end. And if we don't, if we can't cover all of them, what we can add is some quest answers to those questions on the slides, which will then be available on our website. OK, um, and the plan, I think, is to talk. We're going to be sharing a talk, James and I, between 40, about 45 minutes in total. Um, we understand that you may be busy at uh, this time of day, so if you need to slide away, of course, don't worry. And as I say, what we will record this and it's going to be available on the website uh, so you can catch up. And in terms of what we're going to do, we have decided to have a look at some of the cases that have gone on over the last year or so, uh, um, broadly tied together, uh, some themes there. Uh, James is going to start. So I think without much more of a deal, I'm going to hand over to James uh, and you can tell us what you're going to do. Thank you, uh, Martin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, likewise, I'm going to express my gratitude for joining us at such a, a rude hour. Um, it's nice to see so many of you have made that sacrifice. And hopefully, um, who knows, next time, like Martin says, we'll be in person. Um, I'm going to talk about several cases. Um, before I move on the slides, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about three different uh, wasted cost cases third party cost order cases. You can pick your terminology if you wish, one of which is in the course of appeal. The other two are county court decisions, so big question mark over how persuasive they would be. In my experience, given that wasted costs are being used as quite a significant workaround for quarks, uh, I'm sure we might see more authorities in the near future in the appellate courts. So we'll do some wasted costs. Uh, um, updates. Um, I'm then going to touch on the case of Ho and Adelican. Um, I'm sure most of you, at least in the PI world, will be familiar with it. Those outside of the PI world have no reason to be. Um, but it would seem remiss to not include it in an update given its significance. Uh, I'm then going to finally round off with a case talking about everyone's favourite topic with some very helpful comments from a Deputy High Court judge on proportionality. So let's crack on. The first case uh, is Hunt and Analyte Limited and others. And the takeaway from this one is that cross-examination of a solicitor may be permitted, but only in certain circumstances. Um, it's an interesting case because for those of you who've dealt with wasted costs applications, Usually, a main problem for getting wasted costs as a paying party is that if the claimant hasn't, for example, waived privilege, or the party you're seeking the cost order from hasn't waived privilege, and you're pursuing the solicitor for wasted costs, the solicitor can, uh, if I said hide behind it, it might be um, revealing my scepticism, but that is essentially what they can do. and. Uh, they don't have to meet the allegations. Uh, I'm, I'm summarising it, but that's um, where a lot of applications find themselves. But this was a bit different. So as a background, this was a personal injury claim 
um, the claimant issued proceedings for noise induced hearing loss. Uh, and there were three defendants for each of whom the claim worked between 1990 and 2007. Uh, and the claimants represented, Mr Hunt's represented by a firm called Walker Preston's. During the course of that litigation, part 18 questions are asked. Uh, they touched on two issues uh, which are relevant for the purposes of my talk today. The first was, well, excuse me, Mr Hunt, are you the same Mr Hunt that is the director or was the director of one of the very companies that you are suing? Because it would be a bit awkward if you were, given that you were a director of that company and you're now suing them. The second issue uh, was whether or not earplugs had been provided during the course of his employment with another defendant called Paragon. On issue number one, the claimant said, uh, well, what first of all happened was that Walker Preston sent a draft of those part 18s, promising a signed copy to follow. And that signed copy, allegedly signed copy, we should say, said, no, I accept I was born in March 1964, but I have never been a director of Analyte Limited. He was one of the defendants. So clear and unequivocal language. Second, he said earplugs had been provided in the part 18s. And that was repeated in his first, in the, medic, in the first report of his medical expert. But then curiously, in the second report of that expert, the expert says earplugs were not provided. So what was going on? So claimant turns up at trial. Claimant has asked by counsel, well, haven't you signed these part 18s? And forgive my scepticism, but the counsel was returned with the answer that many of us have heard before. It wasn't me. And so that put the claimant and counsel in a bit of a bind. So the case was discontinued at trial. Unsurprisingly, the defendants then apply to have quarks disapplied. One, on the grounds of fundamental dishonesty, um, because guess what, the part 18s have been signed, or appear to have been signed by the claimant. And if that failed, then a wasted costs application against the solicitors, because they were aware that the claimant was saying that I, I didn't sign those part 18s, so there was only one person who could have. And the allegations were these. One, the solicitors failed to obtain proper instructions on the director point. Two, um, not so much an allegation, which is important for reasons we'll come on to. Two, uh, were they signed without the claimant's knowledge? And three, the hearing protection point. Um, the first instance decision before his honour judge Godsmark QC um, was that because the claimant was going to have to give live evidence in relation to FD, fundamental dishonesty, that his solicitor should also give live evidence. Important to note, defendant at that application said, well, we don't necessarily need them to. And claimant's counsel said, well, we're not going to object to live evidence. What, so that order is uh, then made. And uh, between that, the, what the next thing that happens is that the claimant writes a letter to the defendant saying he's got no recollection of signing the recording of his appointment to director at Adelaide, but it was a particularly bad time in his life. Um, but in any event, the case had been really badly handled. Um, the solicitors appeal the decision ordering them to attend for cross-examination, and it comes before uh, Mr Justice Saini in the High Court. On, the appeal was made on two grounds. One, there is no power to order cross-examination of a solicitor. Two, if there was such a power, the discretion was improperly exercised. Mr Justice Saini had no truck with the idea that there was no power to make that order. Uh, and he also had no truck with the idea that the discretion was improperly exercised. 
several factors went into that. Uh, one, the firm was no longer acting for the claimant, so there was no real conflict of interest. Two, privilege had been waived. I pause there, question mark as to whether that's really the case. Three, there were radically different accounts between the claimant and his former solicitor. And four, cross-examination would avoid satellite litigation. After that hearing, uh, the decision was challenged, appeal, ended up in the Court of Appeal, but the claimant then signs a further document waiving all privilege in terms of his communications with Walker Prestons. However, what also happened is that the defendants dropped their allegation that the Part 18 replies were not signed without his authority. And therefore that only left allegations that they were signed without obtaining proper instructions on the director point and that the correction that the medical expert was asked to make, make in terms of no there wasn't any earplugs provided was untrue. So it was all a bit of a mess but the long and short of it in the Court of Appeal and apologies because this is only an update rather than an a, a in-depth look at all the authorities, was this. There is power to order cross-examination of a solicitor or fee earner when the court is exercising its jurisdiction in terms of wasted costs. However, that had to be the exception rather than the rule. So there were lots of issues that would come into play. So number one, the fact that privilege had been waived, if it had been waived, may well mitigate against cross-examination, not for it, because if privilege had been waived, then you could simply look at the documents and make a decision on that. And insofar as privilege had been entirely waived and no response had been given, to the allegations and adverse inference could be drawn. But there was also a need to be fair to the lawyer. Uh, and in terms of being fair, what that really meant was, one, if you're going to allege or claim wasted costs, you have to be as precise as humanly possible in terms of your pleadings. It's no good saying things were conducted in a disproportionate manner. You have to say, exactly what it was that was negligent or improper under the Riddle Hall test, and two, how it caused you to lose costs. Secondly, there should, if cross-examination is going to be ordered, be a mechanism for disclosure. If otherwise, cross-examination, which should be limited, is just going to turn into a fishing expedition. And that is no good for anyone. It's not fair on the lawyers and it's frankly a waste of court time. So in relation to this particular case. One, the allegations made had not been properly defined. It was not clear. Um, and if you read the judgment, you'll you'll see why. But like I said, it's just an update, but it was not clear whether it was being said the part 18s were signed without authority or, or what exactly was being said about the inconsistencies around hearing protection. So for example, it's one thing to say, well, the medical experts account doesn't, is contradictory in and of itself and it doesn't match the part 18, so judge accord no weight to it. It's a wholly different kettle of fish to say, the experts being told by the solicitors to lie in his part 35 report and we want their costs from them. And it wasn't quite clear how far the defendants were willing to push that allegation. So they had to be uh, properly defined. Secondly, I said pause on whether or not the evidence was directly contradictory. Um, because Mr. Sawa, who was the fee earner, 
said there was no evidence. I quote, he said there's no evidence as to whether instructions were or were not taken as to the directorship. That's what the claimant solicitor said on the directorship point. He said, well, I can't say if um, instructions were taken. I can't say if instructions were not taken. The Court of Appeal, surprisingly, in my view, um, frankly, so thought that's of no evidential significance because he's adopting a neutral position. Um, I, I think that's questionable, frankly. Um, it seems a bit odd if instructions were, you ha had no record of, of whether instructions were or were not taken. <clears throat> and finally, um, although Mr. Sawa, um, or not finally, but ultimately, Mr. Sawa uh, was silent on the hearing aids point, and although that silence was taken by his honour Judge Godsmark as uh, a reason for ordering cross-examination, in fact it weighed heavily against it because if the witness statement was silent it would lead to phishing. We don't want that. And like I said, privilege and disclosure hadn't been properly addressed. So that's the case in a very small uh, nutshell. Probably three takeaways from it for those of you dealing with wasted costs applications. Make your allegations precise, and if you're facing allegations, then um, you've got you might be um, you find favour in saying that the allegations are imprecise. Issue of privilege should be resolved, and how that's done is not exactly clear. Um, if you don't have the claimant's cooperation, uh, and ideally, if there's going to be cross examination, there needs to be a mechanism for disclosure. So there we are. Cross examination is possible, but exceptional. Now we're going to deal with two cases, county court cases, um, all about uh, the hot topic of joining experts, useless experts, um, and pursuing them for cost orders where litigation fails. Number one um, question is, what is the bar for joining an expert to proceedings? So this is this case, case in Manchester, claim for gastric illness whilst on holiday. Uh, there was a single joint expert, Dr. Lee, um, a single joint expert who the defendants did not object to being nominated, which was relevant for reasons we'll see. He supported the claim. He then, uh, as these experts do, um, changed his evidence in cross-examination. Previously, he was of the view that the illness was on the balance of probability caused by the food, full stop. In cross-examination, he said the illness was caused either by the food or caught from the claimant's wife, who was, in terms of the claimant's chronology, the first one who was ill. So then all eyes turn on to whether the claimant's wife claim was found proven. She was not found to be a credible witness. And if the judge can't find that on the balance of probability, probabilities she was ill, the judge also can't find on the balance of probabilities that Mr Walker was ill. And so the entire claim was dismissed. Defendant pursues Dr Lee, and there is a dispute. What is the threshold for joining an expert to proceedings? Defendant counsel pointed to a case which is not on the slide, but it is called uh, Centre High Limited and Amen and others. That was a case that involved joining other defendants who were alleged to have funded the litigation, controlled it and acted improperly. So, um, and they caused assets to be removed improperly from the defendant, hiding them from the court. Um, the, case, the, the test in that case was, although cost orders are against non-parties are exceptional, the meaning of exceptional is no more than outside the ordinary run of cases. Okay, so it's not a particularly high bar. Representatives for Dr. Lee say, no, no, that's the wrong case. The only relevant case is a case called Phillips. And the reason that's the only relevant case is because that was the only reported case which arose out of a party giving, uh, uh, who were ordered to pay costs in relation to their live evidence. Um, brief bit of background, uh, Mr Phillips was a psychiatrist who frankly um, had said um, a number of incredible things, refused to change his opinion throughout litigation, 
um, despite being challenged several times, and then lo and behold, come trial, completely collapsed. The test was simply this. If you're going to join an expert, the test is, did the expert cause significant expense to be incurred by giving evidence recklessly and in flagrant disregard of his duties to the court? So a high, um, high bar. So <laughs> it does not mean uh, the judge agreed with that because Phillips was the only case uh, which was comparable um, to joining experts. The test is one of exceptionality, but that does not mean outside the ordinary number of cases. And the reason it is different in terms of policies was that experts are different to other third parties, so litigation funders or what have you, um, because they can take a tactical view about the direction of litigation, experts can't. So if you're going to make a cost order, um, or pursue a cost order against an expert, you've got to make sure the threshold is met. Now that might seem like quite a high bar, given that Dr. Lee, in that case, if you read it, was uh, his evidence fell apart so dramatically. But it's not one that is insurmountable. And this is a case called Robinson and Mercier. Again, it's a county court case. It was in front of a recorder. Um, the facts is so far as germane to the wasted cost part or the third party cost order part of this talk are as follows. This was a claim for dental negligence. Claimant had been referred to hospital for an extraction of three teeth. Uh, another tooth begins to be painful and she's re-referred and the operation goes ahead under general anaesthetic. No note of consent but it was done in a hospital setting by a maxillofacial surgeon. Uh, and those of you who do clinical negligence, and perhaps I'm sure those of you who don't do clinical negligence, know that if you're going to criticise a professional, you better make sure that your expert is of the same discipline. So the claimant instructs a dentist instead of a maxillofacial surgeon. And what should have been clear from the outset unfolds in trial in fairly unsurprising fashion. This is just one extract from the judgment. Can you speak to the standards attributable to a maxillofacial surgeon, Dr Mercier? Yes, I believe so. You've never actually occupied that position, though? No. And since 2000, so 20 years ago, you've never had a patient on the table under general anaesthetic? Correct. But you'd say you were as well placed as Mr. Webster, defendant expert, to speak to the standards to be applied to the evidence of an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. No, defendant expert is a maxillofacial surgeon. He's going to have a lot more experience in a hospital setting than I have. Quite an unbelievable exchange. Um, and if you read the judgment, if you have a spare moment, it is frankly a, a car crash of a case. Um, putting it politely, because the closest Dr Mercier had ever gotten to removal um, uh, uh, under general anaesthetic was a, a placement as, a, as an army officer 20 years ago in an in a, in a army hospital setting. Um, so it's completely different. I think that was uh, during his training. Judge was wholly unimpressed uh, and Here's another extract. The answer that Mr. Webster's an oral and maxillofacial surgeon, so he's going to have more experience, is not a complete answer reflecting the reality. And this judge, if you read the judgment, was extremely upset. He's not simply going to have more experience, he's going to have a lot more experience in a number of areas that Dr. Mercier just doesn't have. Dr. Mercier doesn't have any experience of managing a list in a hospital setting of the facilities to be expected, of the competing pressures, and of the practice of the general body of such professionals. So, um, unsurprisingly, Dr Mercier is landed with uh, a £50,000 bill for the defendant's costs. Uh, like I say, in that case, there are a whole host of other problems with Dr Mercier's evidence. 
for example, um, commenting on x-rays that by his own admission he didn't have until a few days before the joint report. Or when he turned up to this hearing, alleging that actually the people who had put all these allegations in his mouth were the lawyers, um, a, a, a refuge of last resort that I'm sure some of us have heard before. Judge was having no truck with it, costs order made. That's wasted costs. We'll then move on to Home Delican. I'll try and speed through this as quickly as I can, because like I say, uh, I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with it. Essentially, the takeaway is quarks prevents set off of costs versus costs. So what this is all about? Well, it began uh, quite a long time ago with an RTA in 2012. Fairly straightforward, settles by way of part 36. However, unfortunately, the letter uh, making the offer was um, in accordance with part 36, uh, rule 13, such we also offer such costs to be subject to detailed assessment if not agreed. The offer was accepted. So that's the offer made, detailed assessment. Claimant says, aha, we've escaped fixed costs because you've offered detailed assessment. Um, and the defendant disagreed. And so it slowly works its way through the courts. 2018, County Court, 2018, uh, um, October 2018, Circuit Judge, and in November 2019, it gets to the Court of Appeal who say, no, nope, fixed costs apply. But that's where uh, the fun began because the argument did not stop there. What did the Court of Appeal do? They made a cost order in the defendant's favour. Um, unsurprisingly, those costs were substantially more than the fixed costs. So they say, well, well set, can you set off the appeal costs, 48,000 or odd, versus the fixed costs, 16,000 odd? I'll pause there. For those of you who are scratching your heads as to why it can just be set off against damages, this is really important. It's because Cartwright and Venduct, that was a case that said, Essentially, you need an order for damages. Part 36 is not an order, but the purpose of court needs to be a court order. So there was no set off. Uh, there was no enforcement. So the central issue was whether those costs could be set off against fixed costs. The claimant argued that uh, Quarks were intended to be a complete code to bar any enforcement of costs unless an exception applied. Now, Lord Justice Newey thought there were compelling reasons for not allowing set, set off. Lord Justice Males thought there were considerable force in the claimant's point, and Sir Geoffrey Boss agreed. But we've been here before. The Court of Appeal had already decided the point in how, and they said that the costs could be set off. So unsurprisingly, it goes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court agrees with the claimant. Quarks are intended to be a complete code about what the defendant could do with cost orders in its favour. Um, and so where there is no order for damages of interest, there can be no enforcement. And the Supreme Court more than once in the judgment tick off the CPRC for not grappling with this issue. It was raised in Cartwright, and the fact that two eminently constituted courts of appeal differed profoundly over the interpretation of the provisions uh, needed to be sorted out. So that is that decision. This is just a cost update. We could be here for a lot longer discussing the implications, the fallout, from that, what's going to be done about it, but that is perhaps for another day. Finally, before I hand over to Martin, uh, this uh, is not a case about proportionality. It's just a case where some very interesting comments were made about proportionality. <clears throat> the facts of the case are not particularly germane to this talk. Um, it's a case that involved the liability of the insurers under the Third Parties Rights Against Insurers Act, where there were claims uh, of dishonesty. 
about £6 million claim. And come the cost budgeting stage, there's a vast disparity in the budgets. Uh, you'll see there 1.2 million or so versus half a million or so. The reason this case is interesting for the purposes of cost law update is some of you will be familiar with this comment made by Justice Leggett. Touchstone is not the amount of costs which it was a party's best interest to incur, but the lowest amount which could reasonably be have been expected to spend in order to have its case conducted and presented proficiently, having regard to all the circumstances. Um, fairly straightforward. But not so for Deputy High Court Judge Peter Eggers QC who was not certain why the touchstone of reasonable or proportionate costs had to be lowest possibly amount, possible amount, um, the court should allow some flexibility to ensure their actions not unnecessarily and potentially unfairly hampered by an unrealistically low assessment. Expenditure which is within a reasonable and proportionate range is still reasonable and proportionate, even if it is not at the lower end. So I'll leave it there. It's just a nice little comment to have for those of you who are drafting replies uh, to objections on proportionality, especially with those replies, uh, sorry, the um, points of dispute cite Justice Leggett. Then there's a nice point to throw back at the paying party. All right, and at that point, that ends my contribution and I am going to hand over to Martin. Thank you very much. I think you're on mute, Martin. Thank you, James. The number of times I've done that in a hearing is just, just outrageous. Uh, that's very interesting. I think certainly looking at the, it'd be interesting to see what happens in terms of these wasted costs uh, from uh, related to experts, because certainly in my practice, looking at uh, doing clinical negligence and personal injury work, there's a real short supply of experts at the moment. And I've got certainly had some concerns about some new entrants who don't seem to have had a huge amount of experience or are having a go, uh, and it certainly puts the onus on us uh, if, we're, if we're using these experts to make sure they've got the right amount of expertise and experience. Uh, right, I'm going to uh, move over to deal with uh, part 36. Uh, just got my eye on the clock, so I'm going to canter through this fairly quickly. Um, and it's an overview of things which have gone on really for the last uh, 12 months or so. And I'm going to cover, first of all, there's been a change in the CPR 36 5.5 has been added uh, that allows interest to run on uh, part 36 offers. And I can deal with that first. And then there's three cases I was going to look at. Um, Pallet and MGM is about acceptance of offers outside the relevant period. Uh, and really that the, the, the technique used by defendants to accept claimant part 36 offers outside the 21 days if they want to raise points of uh, fundamental points about the applicability of costs. There's London Trocadero, which really looks at what is a genuine offer of settlement. And finally, Global Energy Horizons Corporation, and that's looking at ways that defendants can uh, try and protect themselves from exorbitant claims. Um, and I say, I'm going to canter through these uh, fairly quickly, uh, and the slides will be here in any event. Um, so first of all, CPR. Um, Part 36 of the CPR um, are well known to us, I'm sure, hugely important and pretty dynamic area of law, and, and they were redrawn in 2015. Part 36 is a self-contained code, and it's carefully structured and highly prescriptive set of rules, it's the standard quote. And in fact, Part 36 itself includes um, the provision at 36.2.2, uh, which in essence says that nothing you can make a deal in any way you want, but if you want it to be a part 36 one, you've got to comply with rule 36.5. OK, so that, that's always been the case. Uh, the new provisions come in at 36.5.5. So again, 36.5 tells you what is a part 36 offer. 36.5.4 uh, is the first one there, and it says a part 36 offer which offers to pay or accept a sum of money will be treated as inclusive of all interest until at the end of the relevant period. Um, well, that seems pretty straightforward and obvious, um, but in fact, a number of cases have uh, wrestled with whether a part 36 offer, uh, if it's treated into, if it's in terms of being exclusive of interest, well, can that be a valid one or not? 
civil procedurals have responded to those cases by bringing in 3655. Uh, and you see here it says a part 36 offer to accept a sum of money may take provision for accrual of interest on such sum after the date specified in paragraph four, i.e. after the date of the offer. Uh, if such an offer does not make any such provision, it will be treated as being inclusive of interest up to the date. Um, uh, it's quite an interesting way of dealing with this issue. I'm just going to touch on the cases that brought it up. Um, and the two really uh, in recent or certainly last couple of years, Horn and Prescott number one, they're both cost cases. Um, but Horn and Prescott number one in the High Court uh, wrestled with whether a Part 36 offer made on a for detailed assessment. Uh, it was made in terms of being exclusive of interest. Uh, in other words, it was just an offer made as what, what the bill of cost would give you. Uh, and uh, Mr. Justice Nichols looked at that and was very, after wrestling with uh, the various parts of CPR and practice directions from 47, etc., said actually, no, why not? Why can't you have an exclusive interest? That's fine. Um, later the same year, however, the Court of Appeal wrestled with exactly the same point. Again, it was a cost case. Uh, an offer had been made uh, by a receiving party, so it's claimant, as it were, in terms of um, payment defendant analysis, saying, well, accept 50K, 50,000 pounds on the bill, exclusive interest. And then after detailed assessment, when interest wasn't included, they'd got slightly more. And the other side of the paying party objected, saying, well, that wasn't a proper uh, Part 36 offer, so you shouldn't have all those benefits of beating your own offer. And the Court of Appeal looked at it and came to precisely the opposite answer, uh, uh, in particular saying, no, the rules seem to be clear. Offers for C in terms of um, CPR 36 should be inclusive of interest. And if you try and do it exclusive, that's not a, that's not a, a proper Part 36. And because of it's not done in, in accordance with uh, 36.5, you're outside uh, and you don't get the benefits, or you don't automatically get the benefits. Um, in that uh, Court of Appeal decision, however, Lord Justice Arnold at the end uh, sort of made again a plea uh, for this to be looked at. Um, I think he's quite reluctant uh, in terms of uh, not giving the benefit to the paying party who made a perfectly sensible offer. Uh, he said, it seems to me, however, the issues merit consideration by the CPRC. In my opinion, there are arguments in favour of permitting Part 36 offers to be made which are exclusive of interest, at least in assessment proceedings, if not in general run of claims. And that was his plea. And that's exactly why it would seem the committee have then brought about this change. Um, things to note, this is really looking at claimant offers or receiving party offers who, who and why would you want to put interest on? Uh, well, I suppose in terms of this, if you make an inclusive offer and a year goes by, if it's still inclusive of interest, the sort of substantive value of your, your offer has gone down because, of course, interest has grown since uh, you made the first offer. Now, in some cases, like personal injury cases, for example, those at the moment, certainly, and, and for, for recent memory, those those interest rates have been pretty low and this hasn't been a pressing issue. But of course, if you're dealing with a commercial dispute or maybe contractual interest terms, that can be pretty, pretty significant amount and particularly also in relation to costs. Um, you'll see, of course, over the, the, the rules don't say, well, what rate of interest should be specified? And they also don't say, well, how do we disentangle whether you've, you've beaten an offer or not? Um, and that that's quite an important point there, how the courts deal with a claimant or receiving party offers, which now can be going up in time. In other words, you say, well, I'll accept £50,000 now, uh, but going forward, the interest will apply. So if you accept it six months later, it will be more than £50,000. And the defendants have raised various points saying, well, you know, what's to stop people putting hugely high interest rates uh, on their Part 36 offers. Uh, now, this has been considered actually in a case before um, King in Colonia Construction. Again, the Court of Appeal looked at this, um, and it's Lady Justice Asplin, in fact, who uh, said when, when the issue, in essence, was can you have, in, as incurred in that case, a Part 36 offer was made by someone saying, well, look, yeah, I'll offer you £100,000, but if you're late in taking it, I'm going to charge 8% interest running from then. It was argued that wasn't the proper part 36, but Lady Justice Aston said, well, why not? It seems to be a good way of, of trying to protect someone who's making an offer from a late acceptance, um, which might diminish the value of the offer. 
and how to work it out. Well, Lady Justice Asplund was saying, well, you shouldn't worry too much about high levels of interest being put on it, because if it's too high, of course, the defendant needn't accept it. And of course, the defendant, if they wanted to avoid or argue over that interest, they could make their own counter offer, uh, but just but without that interest applying. I might just push through there. Um, so how applicable, how useful it's been? It came in in April of uh, last year. Um, I haven't seen a huge amount of um, uh, Part 36 offers being made with uh, interest running. Um, defendants who receive uh, offers from claimants may have started seeing that happen. And it may be a factor of my practice mainly being in PI and clear neg. Uh, but it is something that we need to be aware of now. Uh, if you're making an offer uh, and you, you can make it with interest to run, and that's within the rules. Um, there's not much advantage of having a hugely high interest rate attached to your offer. It may feel like that's a bullish thing to do, but in, in reality, it doesn't really promote settlement. Um, and it's likely interest will run, um, or it's likely probably that you want to really match the interest that's running on your claim with the future uh, rate of interest running after a Part 36 offer is made. As I say, a defendant can make their own Part 36 offer if, they, if they're very unhappy with that interest. I think it's, it's unmeritorious, or they may wish to, in fact, argue conduct if uh, if, if an unreasonable position has been taken in terms of an offer. Uh, but it'd be interesting to see how that pans out. I say my, my instincts are commercial and cost disputes may be using it more than uh, sort of PI and Clinic sort of world. Um, but anyway, it's a change we need to be aware of. Um, next one I'm going to talk about is Pallet and MGM. This is a uh, basically acceptance by defendants of claimant offers after 21 days. It's a phone hacking case. Um, it is... Uh, one which has um, been a little bit in the news. It, it's certainly uh, one which has been useful in terms of how to how to approach costs. Um, the claim was brought by Roxanne Pallet, and unfortunately, I'm ashamed to say I had to look her up on um, Wikipedia. But those of you who are fans of Emma Dale will know that she's Joe Styles for a time, and I think now has been in Celebrity uh, Stars and Eyes, Celebrity Big Brother, Celebrity Island with Bear Grylls, and Celebrity Coach Trip. Uh, she was, uh, however, the victim of some phone hacking. Uh, defendant, um, the, the matter was compromised by the, uh, she made a, a, a Part 36 offer. Uh, defendant sought to, or wanted to disapply a period of the claimant's costs. So the, the defendant wanted to accept the offer she made, £95,000 or so. Uh, but it did not want to, or it wanted to raise arguments about whether or not it should pay all her costs up to the date of the offer being accepted. And in fact, he wanted to say, look, we're only going to pay your costs up to when we gave you our defence, because then you must have known the value was low. Um, and so to do this, the defendant deliberately waits 21 days from after the claimant's offer, and on the 22nd day, accepts it, um, but argues, we don't want to pay uh, all your costs up to that date, and, and then the cost dispute develops. Uh, the reason that this is needed to wait for 21 days is CPR 3613.1 stipulates if you offer if you if a defendant accepts within the 21 days the claimant will be entitled to the cost of the proceedings up to the date on which the notice of acceptance was served on the offeror uh, pointing to the fact that you can't then say well i don't i'm not going to pay all your costs up to the date i want to pay your cost up to when i gave you my defense so to avoid that you wait till after 21 days because the rules say if the defendant accepts after 21 days um uh, I can skip through this. The liability for cost must be determined by the court. So there's no automatic or uh, order from the Part 36 provisions to pay your costs up to the date of the order. And in assessing that, the court will apply all the circumstances of the case and the matters listed in 36.17.5. And that's the usual injustice provisions for when applying 36 criteria. Um, and Mr Justice Mann uh, considered this, and it's quite useful to just, he, he gives a quite nice, clear exposition of how those rules operate. But in essence, says this, those are the rules. That's how it works. There's nothing stopping a defendant waiting for 21 days and then applying for, uh, or then accepting an offer, but then arguing over the costs. And that's what the rules say. Um, I think I saw earlier last year, the Rules Committee were again making a subcommittee to perhaps have a look at this. But it seems a bit cumbersome to have to work that basis. Uh, if you've got a concern over the costs. Um, 
And in fact, Mr Justice Manor went on to to find that the claim was perfectly reasonable in not accepting the defence earlier. So it didn't come to anything anyway. But that's a process and something defendants can think about and certainly be aware of. If you want to argue the costs, there's no you should probably wait for a day or two after the offer expires. Uh, the next case I'm going to look at um, again is what is a genuine offer? And this touches on 3617 again. Um, 3617, uh, and in particular subsection or subpart five, and there we've got what are the injustice provisions. So whether or not you should give someone the benefit of a part 36 win, uh, you have to look at whether that would be unjust to do so. And you have to look at all the circumstances of the case, in terms of the offer, stage of proceedings, information available, conduct of the parties, and last one there, whether the offer was a genuine attempt to settle the proceedings. Or was it a genuine attempt? And the case I'm looking at here is London Trocadero. So that's the, the famous Trocadero. Um, uh, well, so it's a cinema uh, uh, up in, in London, central London. Uh, in fact, it's a landlord uh, for a number of cinemas working from there. And a dispute had arisen over the uh, payment of rent at the really point of the first lockdown, when of course cinemas weren't able to open. Uh, but there was a contract of a rent to be paid and uh, a dispute in the, in the region of three million pounds for the unpaid rent arrears. And part of that claim, in fact, was for about 800,000 pounds for uh, two missed dates in June and September 2020. Um, the claimant, uh, Trocadero, uh, basically had a contractual agreement for that to, for rent to be paid. Um, and then they offered to settle, however, for a uh, £8,000 less than the £840,000 of that part of the claim, i.e. about 1% of the value. Um, and in fact, what they said is we'll, we'll, we'll knock off that small amount uh, and that's our genuine offer and our genuine attempt to settle. They waited for 21 days and the defendant didn't accept it within that time and then they immediately then applied for summary judgment, which they were successful in and then sought to get the full uh, uplift in terms of the entire claim against the defendants, uh, the part 36, uh, 17 benefits. Um, and in terms, th this is one where I think it's Robin Voss sitting as a Deputy High Court judge had a look at this uh, and said, actually, yeah, that, why not? That was a genuine offer. Yes, it was 99% of the total claim. Uh, but in fact, the defendant had been um, applying to or, or saying they were going to robustly uh, uh, a counterclaim and that they couldn't possibly have paid this money. Um, but yeah, 99% was genuine um, following the case of Raw Bank. Um, but and he actually they went through and said, well, in which case, why should I reduce it? But then he looked at the wholly exceptional circumstance of the pandemic and looked at the injustice and did actually give some relief. Uh, a separate side issue, uh, not just about the issue of a 99% offer being genuine. Um, he did look at some of the criteria. He said in this case, the defendant said that they would defend it. The claimant thought the defendant was perfectly able to pay, but was choosing not to. And particularly in this case, there really was a binary function on this. Either rent was due or not. So it's not a case where, you know, there's a lot of vagaries over, again, a PI or clean egg claim about the value of it. Uh, and, and if the defendant effectively had no defence, he really should have, should have accepted that offer. And there's no reason why the uplift shouldn't be applied. Um, Supplementary points here, and it wasn't fully argued, but it's one that did arise. And um, the the claimant was saying, "Well, hang on, if we've won on part thirty seven, part thirty six on on the eight hundred thousand part of the claim, actually we want the uplift on the whole three million. Thank you very much." Um, and uh, in essence, Robin Voss had a look at that and said, "Well, no, I don't think that can be right. You can only really get the the uplift on your damages and costs for the part of the offer, part of the claim that the offer related to." And it also looked at whether or not if you is it a binary function for the additional amount under part 3617 and the answer he said was no why can't i just give you half of that uh, and again that, that's something that may come up in our uh, more everyday practice okay last one and i know we're very short of time so i'm just going to canter through this this is global energy horizons corporation it's early on in 2001 in fact uh, this is a hugely complicated bit of litigation uh claimant alleging 228 million pounds worth of uh, losses uh, through endless hearings, but in particular one um, uh, 21 day period of, of, of high court time 
the defendant was eventually ordered to pay the claimant three million pounds, so about 1.6 percent. And the original cost ruling when looking at how the cost should lie uh, was that overall this was a, you know, a, a case where both sides had lost heavily. There's a total you know, score draw, I think is the, 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 the term used. And the first and the judge said, well, look, no order for costs. And I think in reality, saying a plague on both your houses, you know, you, you, neither of you should get any costs from the other. Uh, the Court of Appeal looked at this uh, and said, well, no, that, that's got to be wrong. The claimant won damages of over three million pounds. It was a tiny amount of the total, uh, but said this, when a defendant's faced with an exorbitant claim, which he wishes to defend vigorously, but where he's vulnerable to a finding that he's liable for a much smaller amount, there is a clear process provided by CPR 36, which can follow, which can follow, which he can follow to protect his position. I think that's just a reminder there that, that you know, the, the terms of the, the part 36 are pretty strict. Um, but if you think that you're at risk on a small amount, then defendants can protect themselves with those lower offers. Right. I think that's probably going to be the end of where we are uh, in terms of um, trying to wrap up. Um, I haven't been keeping a track on whether there's any questions which have arisen from those, but those are the ones I've looked at for part 36. There's a handful of other cases too, which I could have picked on, but those were the ones I thought might be most applicable. Um, James, can you see if you've got any comments or questions? If your chat function is like mine, Martin, it's playing up and it's saying we're having trouble loading your message to try refreshing. Um, if yours is doing that, and then everyone else's is doing that, many apologies. Not sure what happened. It's not some conspiracy for Martin and I to um, palm off any questions and avoid them. Uh, it's a genuine technical error. Uh, I'm sure if you've got something burning, feel free to pick up the phone or get in touch with either of us or anyone else in the cost team that I'm sure would be happy to help. Uh, I, that, I can't see questions on my, my function. I don't yeah. know. Where you can yeah, likewise. Um, ah, it seems, I see. <laughs> Now I think we've just got them coming through. A few have come through. It turns out. Uh, I see, uh, Jane ba Barker, what was the cost decision on Global Energy Horizon? Um, well, the final decision on that was. Um, if I just go back to my. Um, yeah, the, the cost should flow, therefore, for the defendant, uh, in this case, who paid the three million, was going to would pay the claimants significant costs. Uh, arising out of the, the litigation. Um, so in other words, it wasn't a no order for costs, each side bear their own. The Court of Appeal said no, the, the claimant won, won three million, and the, the usual order would follow with the defendant needing to pay those costs that were reasonably proportionate incurred. So uh, that was quite a big loss for the defendant in terms of that outcome. But thank you for making <laughs> a, a question, Jane. <laughs> right, if we, if you think of any others, as I say, do, do, do add them to that list. Um, what we can do is, of course, add uh, our answers to, uh, as I said, we can add some slides at the end of this and add some answers to that. Thank you very much. Great. All right, thanks very much, guys. Very nice to see you.